you as a pastor, as a leader in the church, you know, you're always trying to get people to do more, you know, um, spend more time praying, reading, spend more time at the church and spend more time engaging with um, fellow believers. And we have that desire within us, but wait a minute, I've got to pay my bills. Um, I've got to get my kids to sports or whatever. I'm Sometimes I'm working two jobs, three jobs or whatever. And we're doing that because um, our our lives are being inflated away and we don't realize what's going on. And so if so, if our lives are being inflated away, that means we're spending less and less time with each other and with the Lord. Imagine what would happen if our lives are being deflated. We're getting our time back. Um, yeah. And that's what Bitcoin does. Welcome to the Empowered Manhood Podcast, where men rediscover courageous masculinity. Pull up a chair as we gain strength from the stories of God working in the lives of ordinary men today. These men have discovered that in a world of superficiality and isolation, we need authentic brotherhood to gain strength for the battles we face every day. Brought to you by the ministry of CLC, which challenges men to an uncommon pursuit of Christ, welcome to Empowered Manhood. Hey guys, welcome back to the Empowered Manhood podcast. My name is Mike Hatch and I serve as the National Relationship Generator with CLC. And I am along with, of course, my co-host and good buddy, Chris Bollinger, who is the best-selling Amazon author of Daily Strength for Men. And uh, his new book just released, 52 Weeks of Strength for Men, which I highly encourage you to go check out. Unfortunately, today I had to go it alone for this interview Chris's father has just recently passed away, so please be in prayer for him as he is and his family mourn the loss of uh, his father. So today we have an interview with a CLC alumni, which is always fun, who's familiar with uh, with CLC, been through, he's been through the two-year all-in study in CLC down in Georgia at a church down there, and uh, he'll share a little bit about that experience with them, but Recently, he has been working in missions and uh, in some really innovative ways by using Bitcoin. And I realize when I say Bitcoin, there's a, all sorts of different thoughts on uh, it that maybe come into your mind. Um, maybe skepticism, maybe, well, isn't that just a cryptocurrency and isn't it you know a bad investment and all, all sorts of different thoughts. Well, we talk about that during the interview. Uh, Patrick and many other missionaries around the world are actually finding great use cases for Bitcoin as they reach uh, lost people groups. And, um, and not just that, but, but help to um, meet some real felt needs in those communities. Now, a little background on Patrick. He is a trained ear, nose, and throat surgeon and sleep specialist. He trained at Walter Reed Army Medical Center and was on active duty with the U.S. Army for 13 years. He left the Army in 2006 as a lieutenant colonel and started his private practice career. Patrick did his undergraduate studies at Houston Baptist University and attended medical school at Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center. He was an Alpha Omega Alpha graduate. Patrick holds nearly 30 U.S. and international patents. Patrick has been involved in church ministry from positions as an elder and lay missions pastor. He is passionate about God's mission to the ends of the earth. He's been on numerous mission trips to Guatemala, Indonesia, India, and Ukraine. Patrick is also a serial entrepreneur, if you couldn't tell by all the patents that he has. He first learned about Bitcoin in 2013, but made his first purchase in 2018 and has hodled ever since. For those of you who don't know, hodled just means held onto and not sold. So he's hodled Bitcoin ever since 2008, 18, excuse me. He's written extensively about Bitcoin's truths and the impact it has on believers and non-believers. His essays can be found on Medium, TI67 Corvette, and we'll, I'll put that link in the show notes below for you. Patrick also hosts a weekly podcast called Mission Bitcoin, where he interviews guests and discusses the intersection between Bitcoin and the Christian faith. I love personally about just, just the innovative approach he's taken as a guy who has um, brought his, his career in terms of the medical profession and his heart for God and combined these two things 
in or in taking a real real entrepreneurial approach to missions. I think that is so key in our interview. So he shares his his story. Of course, we hear um, we talk a little bit about Bitcoin. Um, we talk about how Bitcoin uh, is being used by God all over the world and the ways that Bitcoin actually reflects um, some truths and aspects and the character of God. And then lastly, we hear some incredible ways that uh, that Patrick is using Bitcoin to uh, to impact people in Guatemala. So, all right, let's go ahead and jump in. Here is our interview with Patrick Melder. Patrick Melder, welcome to the Empowered Manhood Podcast. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, man, I'm, I'm really excited to uh, to have you on to talk about something that may seem to some some guys, wait a second, what, you're talking about Bitcoin on a, on a men's podcast, men's discipleship? Like, what is this? So, well, first of all, let's start with, um, we want to hear your fence post story. And, uh, and so for those of you who haven't listened before, maybe this is your first episode, we have every guest share their fence post story. And it's something that is, uh, is I guess, akin to, well, CLC basically started it. You think about, you think about a fence along a property, and every vertical post that holds up the horizontal part of the fence represents a significant moment in your life or person in your life. And, uh, and so, and so we're going to have you share that Patrick, but before we even get into that, let's just mention the fact that you are actually a CLC alumni. You went through CLC yourself. Yeah, I, it was a great experience. I did that, uh, Boy, it's going back a little bit, uh, maybe 2011 to 2013, something like that. Um, but it was a great experience. It was at North Metro Church here in Kennesaw, Georgia, and with a great bunch of guys. And it was a fantastic experience. And, you know, for those who may be listening to this and not not been through CLC, uh, definitely highly recommend, you know, uh, men are kind of hesitant to interact on a personal, you know, intimate level. And even still, um, st I struggle with that. Well, but by nature, I'm an introvert, but it was definitely worth it. And I would encourage any, any guy out there to seriously consider um, um, doing something like this for sure. Amen, man. Amen. That's awesome. Okay. So then, all right, Patrick, let's hear, before we dive into some of this other stuff and what you're doing in missions uh, with Bitcoin, let's hear your, uh, your fence post story. Yeah, great. Um, so I, uh, I guess I'll just start at the at the very beginning. I I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I grew up in a broken home in the in the seventies, mm -hmm. and became a believer really from uh, a classmate of mine in high school. I was I believe I was a freshman, and he was basically selling fire insurance, and I bought it. And you know back <laughs> then. The, you know, the Hal Lindsey's of the world were saying that the, you know, he wrote a book called The, the Late Great Planet Earth. And so, you know, uh, uh, the earth was going to hell in a handbasket just around the corner. So um, I bought that fire insurance, but the Lord um, knew he had to work for me. And I uh, developed a, a, a faith over the years, got baptized in the Nazarene church. But mm. I guess probably the first, um, besides my being saved, um, the first major fence post for me was two guys that older than me um, that were in a church of Christ that I went to uh, immediately after that just took the time. They were probably in their early to mid thirties, uh, young family, and they just took their time to mentor me. And at that age, I was in, uh, you know, junior, senior high school, early college career, and when most people were in the youth group, I was kind of in the adult Bible study, trying to learn as much as I could. And they just, they just mentored me. And that was, that had a profound impact on me uh, for, for years. And even to this day. And I guess the, the second major thing that really shaped my life was joining the army. I think that mm. the, I was pretty disciplined or, or maybe not disciplined. I was pretty uh, black and white. Um, but the army really kind of shaped who I would later become. And I ended up spending about 13 years active duty, all told between reserve status and, and active duty and being in school. It's been about 20 years uh, associated with the military. And then I, you know, I, I got early, I got married at an early age. I graduated from college and then married my wife when I was a senior in college. And then, you know, she's been with me through 
medical school and, and all that. So we've been married for about 33 years. I, I mean, I would, she's probably the, hmm. she's the outweighted weight fence post along the, the whole trail. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah. uh, yeah, she's the cement post. Um, <laughs> definitely great. my, definitely my better half. And yeah. I think that um, another major, I, I have two more fence posts for you. I think another, yeah. well, I probably three, but another major fence post would be when I was in the early 2000s, I was a, the, the lay missions pastor of a Bible church in Maryland. Hmm. And a little bit prior to me assuming that role, I was involved in essentially what was a CLC at a local level. Um, this is at Durwood Bible Church in Maryland. And the pastor, uh, Steve Pettit, had a group called, he created a group called Joshua's Men, and he created this curriculum all his own. We had books that we would read. And I, if I remember correctly, it was a year long course. We met every week on a Saturday and it was a very similar format to CLC. So when CLC came along a little bit later, you know, about 10 years later, I was very familiar with the, the concept and really um, grew out of that experience and wanted to be re-engaged with that experience and so when i started when we moved down here to to georgia and then started attending north metro and they were starting the clc program uh i was very keen to, to kind of get plugged back into that so that was nice. that was great and then i think probably the last fence post we'll talk about which will be a good segue into what we're doing is my interaction with Bitcoin and uh, not a person, not a thing, but uh, a movement, a revolution. Uh, <laughs> it's been truly been transformative. And, and I think that hopefully we'll get into this in the discussion, but yeah. I think that some of the, the, the angst that I felt as a Christian with what was going on in the world uh, was explained by kind of looking into Bitcoin and it really mm. answered a lot of questions. You know, uh, we have the truth, but there's a lot of things going on in the world that we just don't quite have the knowledge to understand what's going on. And Bitcoin was able to answer those uh, material or um, metaphysical questions that we all have. We, we have the spiritual thing covered, but um, we can still have some angst when we're trying to, to marry the, the metaphysical and the, and the spiritual. And I think for me, Bitcoin has just allowed us to allowed me to have a reinvigorated um, relationship with the Lord for sure. Man, that's so cool. And I, <clears throat> I couldn't agree with you more when I was, um, you know, it was a couple, well, maybe a month ago now or so that we were down in Miami for, uh, for the Bitcoin conference. And uh, I got to meet you actually at the pre-conference conference, the Thank God for Bitcoin conference, which uh, for those who don't know, Jimmy Song um, is a Bitcoin programmer, a big influencer in the Bitcoin world who uh, is a Christian, brought together about 200 other Christians down there. And, uh, and I got to hear from you and others about uh, really the theology that, that underpins your perspective on Bitcoin and uh, economics in general, too. But, um, and that was, that was absolutely mind-blowing to me and, and, and refreshing as a pastor, especially, to hear how theologically on point um, all of you were. In, in those who, who presented and, and spoke at the conference, that was very reassuring and, and really caused me to look deeper as well. And, and I've, I've experienced the same thing. You, so you wrote the book, uh, The Christian Case for Bitcoin, and uh, it's Bitcoin Redeems Money, How This Affects Christians and Why We Should Care. And, uh, and reading your book has been incredible. It definitely, um, it has taken me deeper in my faith as I've looked at it. And I guess, let me ask you this, because I think this is, this is, I feel like a good metaphor. Maybe I think of an Amos when God is holding that, that plumb line, you know, and he says, and I found you Israel to be wanting, you know, he's holding in, in using a, uh, an object, a technology that humans created that happens to reveal the crookedness of, of the world. And I think I, I thought of Bitcoin very similar to that as this technology that, um, that reflects or, or, or puts a mirror up to the corruption that's going on in the world. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. And that's, that's uh, familiar with Amos, but that I've not used that in my uh, correlation with Bitcoin. I think that's an excellent uh, analogy. 
And I, I draw though that similar um, analogy within the book. I didn't use Amos as an example, but that's exactly what Bitcoin is. I mean, Bitcoin is the truth that uh, you know it, it's an overused metaphor. But the orange pill, the red pill, green pill, and the matrix. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, you know, Bitcoin being the orange pill. Once you once you go down what we call in the Bitcoin circles, the rabbit hole of understanding what Bitcoin is, it's hard. You, you see the standard of truth within Bitcoin. You can't manipulate it. And then when you start seeing the standard of truth that can't be manipulated, then you start asking your quest yourself questions about, well, wait a minute, what, what about all this other stuff that's going on that can be manipulated, like our monetary system? And that, then that, that leads you down all these other roads of what's been influenced by what we call the fiat mindset or, or the, um, you know, I make this case in, in the Christian case for Bitcoin. I mean, really, no one has the authority to create from nothing. And except God alone. And the state has taken that authority and usurped God's ability um, or authority in creating something from nothing, and that's money. And Robert Breedlove, also a co-author of Thank God for Bitcoin, has a saying that money is the base layer of society. And after reading about it, understanding it, I totally agree with it. And I think for us, we have a base layer in Christ but there's this base layer in the metaphysical world and in the physical world that um, has been corrupted. And I, for me, what it was like is like um, something's going on. I don't quite understand what it is. But then when I started learning about Bitcoin and it started pointing like the plumb line, it started pointing to <laughs> all these other yeah. things. It just made yeah. sense. It's like, oh, this is what's wrong with, you know, our economy. This is what's wrong with, you know, um, you know, fact checkers on Twitter and stuff like that. It just started making so much more sense. Yeah, for sure. So you are, uh, well, you're an entrepreneur, of course, but you're you're an ENT doctor as well. Um, so t talk a little bit about what transitioned you from from that to to now really being passionate about Bitcoin, and we'll get to it in just a moment, but your missions work in Guatemala. Well, um, that's a tough question because it's, it's very personal and intimate. Um, hmm. You know, I, I, I love helping people. I loved being a doctor and a surgeon, but um, the, the, and this, this goes on into um, the Bitcoin thing too, there was just the the joy of being a doctor has been overtaken by um, the the business of medicine, and you know I I'm on the receiving end of why is medicine so expensive because I'm the public face of of that, but what most people don't realize is that one of the re and medicines and the cost of medicine is a very complex subject, but I'm I'm just kind of giving it a very basic overview here, but. Yeah. The one thing that people don't understand is that one of the reasons that medicine has become more expensive is that the since um, since the early 70s, but certainly since the early 90s, when managed care started taking over and um, certainly after the Affordable Care Act earlier this um, in the 2010s, um, the number of administrators has just completely um it's kind of a linear growth of administrators within medicine. The number of doctors has been pretty slow growth and um, it's slow growth because the process of becoming a doctor is pretty long. You know how many medical schools there are in the, in the country, you know how many doctors are going to graduate. And so you can predict um, how many doctors are going to be there year after year. Well, if a hospital needs more administrators, they just put a, you know, go to LinkedIn or indeed and say, we need a, a new administrator for X, Y, Z. And um, you need more and more administrators because the regulations to comply with medical um, regulations um, becomes more and more complex. So I was on the receiving end of that, really not enjoying the, the, the business of medicine. And I was also running another company full time, basically working two full time jobs um, as a surgeon, as an entrepreneur. 
being on call, getting called to go to the emergency room at two or three o'clock in the morning, having to wake up the next morning, go to the clinic and run a business on, on top of that. So the pressure was just a lot. And then I was having some interpersonal relationship issues with my partners. And I just got to a point of uh, severe depression and mm. to the point that when my oldest daughter was going to get married, um, I didn't even want to go and had to, I, you know, I live here in Georgia and I have a lot of guns and I locked them up. For, I mean, I, I, I just didn't want, and they were locked yeah. up for about a year. So kind of, that's kind of a long way to say that I had to step away from medicine because it was just too much. And um, my company was getting into a position where I could do that without um, significant financial issues. And it, that afforded me time to really kind of do what I love to do and study the things that I want to study, which as a doctor, you don't really have time to, you become a very good technician in medicine. And, you know, you don't have time, a lot of times to kind of study other things and, and whatnot. So, yeah. you know, just trying to be real with the audience out there, I would encourage, and then I had to seek, you know, professional help and all that. So um, it's real, the pressure's real, but um, that afforded me time to step away from medicine, uh, really reconnect with the Lord and um, yeah, just get to the a point of the bottom, but trusting that the Lord is going to work everything out. Yeah. Man, Patrick, thank you for sharing that, man. That's, yeah. that's, um, it clearly <laughs> you have CLC in you because you're, you're, you're very transparent and honest. And I just, yeah. I applaud and I appreciate your, uh, your vulnerability. That's, you know, we, that's what we talk about in CLC here and on, on the show all the time is bringing our stuff into the light as opposed to hiding in the dark. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, um, yeah, man, I've, I've been there myself. I've had my own struggle with, uh, with depression myself and, um, had, had sought counsel and therapy as a result of it. Um, I remember coming out the other end of it, <laughs> my wife, when we were walking into a store and we were joking about something. And then all of a sudden it hit her that like, oh, wow, he's different now he's back to, and she goes, oh, there you are. Mm -hmm. There you are. I didn't know where you were this whole time because I'd become so different even to her. Yeah. So, um, man, it, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Cause I know there are guys out there who, who, uh, hopefully won't, will feel less alone knowing that we, we know we've been yeah, there before for sure. So, okay. So you made that transition, um, after feeling really burdened by the medical profession and, and some of the constraints that were placed on you. Um, and so it, it sounds like you went more toward an entrepreneurial kind of side of things. Um, where did that lead you at first? Well, um, I think in a, I don't know how to answer that other than feeling free, you know, hmm. pursuing for once something that was not contrived or controlled, but something that I wanted to do. Hmm. And um, it just made me feel very free. And I think for, you know, one of the unique things about being a physician is the barrier to exit is so high. You know, we spend so many years training, huh. we, okay. we make, and so it's not like, um, I want to, let's just make it simple. Let's say that instead of being a doctor, I was an entrepreneur and let's say that I started a, a business or I have a shop down the street. If things aren't working out right, I just close the shop and maybe come up with a new idea and open up another shop a couple of months later and start selling something new or, or whatever. Uh, medicine, you spend years getting there. You spend a lot of money getting there. You have a lot of debt when you get done. You do make a lot of money, but what most people don't realize is probably for the first 10 to 15 years after finishing your training, you're paying back all that debt. And you're also starting, usually starting families. I started my family earlier, but you're usually starting families. You bring on a mortgage. So paying back medical school debt and then living in um, a, a, a doctor's lifestyle, you're, you're basically paying like two mortgages. Um, and then you, uh, you get into this track. And if you, if, if, for instance, you don't like what you're, where you're practicing, the city or the partners that you're with, a lot of times you sign uh, non-competition clauses or, or contracts where you can't practice within, you know, 10, five to 10 miles, which 
in a metropolitan area, that's that's pretty significant, especially if you've built up your life and your family and your connections where you live, and you don't want to be traveling 10 miles some other direction. And you can't go to another state easily because you've got to get another license. And uh, so the barrier to get out and the loss of income to get out is like, okay, that's significant. And it really makes you think. So taking the entrepreneurial leap is it's it, you have to really count the cost. And I think for so long, I wasn't able to make that leap because of obligations I had. And when you when I was able to actually do it and just actually, you know, really for the first time, get in a position where I had to completely trust the Lord, you know, and yeah. I'm a I'm a type A driven person. And I would say that literally for the first time in my life, when I quit medicine, I had to say, Lord, I have no idea how we're going to make it. I have to mm -hmm. trust in you. And literally, and, you know, surgeons aren't used to saying, okay, uh, I'm going <laughs> to, you know, I walk into the operating room and say, I have no idea what I'm doing. You know, we're, we're used to being in control. We're used to having a plan. Yeah. And, you know, so um, that's a very difficult thing to do. Hmm. And, but the Lord taught me a lot. It was, it was a very humbling experience and I am so thankful for it. Nothing didn't want to go through it. A lot of pain in it, but would I do it again to be where I am now? Absolutely. That's so cool. I love it. Okay. So then, and, and by the way, I've, I've, I've never heard that before. You, someone saying the barrier to exit is, is high that, wow, that is, that was enlightening. I appreciate yeah. you sharing that. Um, and it gives me to some of my friends who are in the medical profession, it, um, yeah, hel helps me with a little bit more empathy there too. Yeah. That's what they're going through. Um, now you, before, um, before Bitcoin and your project in Guatemala, the book, you were involved in some, um, missionary work as an ENT, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So when I finished my training, I, I trained in the army. I spent 13 years active duty, but I, I trained at Walter Reed Army Medical Center, the old one, not the new one that's now in Bethesda, Maryland, but the one that's in DC. And when I finished my training, I decided that I wanted to use my medical skills on the mission field. And I didn't know what that was going to look like. And I, I took my first step in being a part of a mission trip from YWAM, Youth with the Mission. And that was in 99. And we, I didn't know anybody on the team. We all met in uh, Minneapolis and flew from there to Amsterdam and then India. We spent three weeks in India. And I spent my time working with a Hindu ENT surgeon. And I was just to be, it was relational ministry, relational evangelism. And I, we did that for three weeks. And when I got back, I, uh, it was around that time that I did the CLC program, uh, the Joshua's Men program, pardon mm -hmm. me, at the church, the Bible church. And then shortly thereafter, I became the lay missions pastor for the church and eventually went on three or four mission trips to India and sent many trips from my church out to other parts of the world learned a lot about missions, took a really influential course. Well, I was going to take the course called Perspectives, which is a really significant missions indoctrination about why missions is so important. And that really lit the fire in me about why missions is so important for God's kingdom, because God is a missionary God. And when I, and then subsequently went to Ukraine um, in, hmm. I think, 2006, and then my, as my girls were getting older, they needed my, I mean, I always needed to be home, but um, at that point, my wife was like, okay, Patrick, um, you need to be home with us and the girls. And so uh, I didn't go on missions, on a missions activity for quite some time. But then when they got older, like in middle school, high school, I decided that I want to, wanted to impart that sense of service and mission to my girls as, as my wife did too. And in fact, I, I, this, this next phase of our, of our, mission walk was not because of me. It was because of my wife. We were at North Metro where I did CLC and we had a couple that was sent out from the church to Guatemala. They were up speaking one Sunday afternoon and 
my wife went up to Angel, who was the, the wife of uh, Lee, uh, the Radfords, and they were doing work down in Guatemala. And we were really, my wife was really interested. And she said, we'd love to come down and see you guys in Guatemala. And later on, we realized that Angel had heard that a lot. And a lot of times, you know, people just never follow up. Yeah. Well, we followed up. And then for six years, from 2012 to 2018, we took our girls as a family mission trip down to Guatemala every summer. And we did an art camp for the, the school that we're now doing the Bitcoin mission stuff with. And yeah, so um, that's, that's our original connection with Guatemala. Yeah. Wow. That is really cool. Okay. So then, okay. So that it's I'm starting to fit the pieces together. So you had a, you had a heart for Guatemala as you guys were going down there for at least six years. And then 2018 ish, I think is when you said that was when Bitcoin kind of came up on your radar, right? Yep. Yep. How did now, that, but happen? that, but yeah, yeah, but that had nothing to do with Guatemala at the time. Actually, uh, my wife and I, I went to, um, it may have been after our last trip to Guatemala, we went, we ended up going to Puerto Varta in Mexico. And, you know, Bitcoin was kind of in the news because in late 2017, early 2018, it was an all time high. And I had, in fact, I had heard of Bitcoin first in 2013 and completely dismissed it. Like, like most, a lot of Bitcoiners have regret stories. And so, um, but in 2018, we were in Puerto Varta and just vacationing. And I started kind of researching a little bit. And as I started researching Bitcoin in particular, I understood immediately the impact that um, the underlying technology, the blockchain technology, what it would have in a developing country. Because once you put something, for those who don't know, once you put something on um, the Bitcoin blockchain in particular, it's immutable, you can't change it. And I thought, wow, I mean, in a developing country, in times of civil strife or civil war, you know, property rights are, are just mm. forgotten and land seized and taken away. But if you've got something on a blockchain, then that person could have rights to that property, you know, forever. And I, so I bought my first Bitcoin then. And again, because I was a busy physician and entrepreneur, didn't really have a lot of time to really make, go all, down all the rabbit holes. Um, but that's when I first bought Bitcoin and really just bought it. And what we call dollar cost averaged. I didn't know what the, that term meant at the time, mm. but it's big. It's big within the Bitcoin community of just buying. I mean, I think everybody knows what it, what it means, but I I didn't realize that's what I was doing with Bitcoin. I just bought a little bit at a time and and kind of automatically. So, um, yeah. So that's that's kind of how that that worked. Yeah. Okay. So you so you started acquainting yourself with the technology first and understanding what it what it meant and and uh, and began to start buying some Bitcoin. Um, so I explain what happened. Where when, where was that spark? You know, or the light bulb that went off for you. I'm like, oh my gosh, can this transform what we're doing in Guatemala? That I think, and I don't want this to be political, but I I think that. It, no matter what side of the political aisle you're on, I think our last our last election cycle was a little odd, and um, yeah. that that just started raising my eyebrows as to what something this is just something's weird here. And my brother had recommended my I have a twin, he, um, but we're fraternal. We don't look anything alike. He's an attorney in in Dallas. Uh, well, used to be an attorney in Dallas, but. Um, he recommended a book called um, The Creature from Jekyll Island. Oh, and classic. They, One of yeah. my favorites. <laughs> yeah. Now, it does have a kind of a conspiratorial bent, but it, right. it nonetheless uh, opened my eyes. And Jekyll Island is an island off the coast of Georgia here. So I was familiar with Jekyll Island. And so the name kind of intrigued me. And I started reading it. And then it started kind of opening my eyes to there are a few, there's a small group of people that I don't, I don't think there's, they don't set out to conspire. Mm -hmm. They are in positions of power where they can do what they want to without anybody's permission. And it has a ripple effect that none of us know about. And mm -hmm. I guess, um, and as I, as I was reading that book, he referenced uh, Carol Quigley, um, a history book written by Carol Quigley called, um, tragedy and hope. And it's basically a, a pervasive history of the world from um, 
just after the, the, the fall of the Roman Empire up to modern time, uh, and it was written in the 60s. So I started reading, it's a tome, it's a very massive tome, but everything that, so coming from a completely different perspective, he, in Quigley's book, he basically said the same, he was recounting the same sorts of, of narratives where it, a small group of people make major decisions that affect a lot of people. And I think probably the, the one thing that kind of put this in perspective for me was reading about the, the start of World War I. And uh, Winston Churchill was not the, the prime minister of, of England at the time. I, I don't remember what his position was, but he was in, a, he was, he was in government and a, power, a position of power. And the, I think it was the Lusitania that was a, uh, uh, torpedoed by the Germans. And that's what eventually brought the U.S. into war. Mm -hmm. But there was he allowed that to happen. And mm -hmm. on top of that, the the U.S. was a major bondholder for uh, debt of a lot of the uh, countries that were involved in the First World War. And had they not the England uh, was and, and the allies at the time were on the verge of defeat. Um, and had the U.S. not come into war, they would have probably lost the war. And so there was a there was an economic opportunity. The bankers decided that influenced the decision that, OK, if we don't win this war, we're going to lose a lot of money. Um, so it was just so as you follow that that theme of control and power and money, you see that it, it's really no different today. And I, I think that. If you can't see that right now with what the Fed is doing at the to the extent that they're doing, um, then you're not reading the right books or you've, you've got to, I don't know, kind of reorient how you think. And so that was kind of the tipping point for me, that last election cycle and kind of learning a little bit more about history. I love history anyway, so that was not a tough, tough thing for me to, to read about. And then the plumb line comes along, Bitcoin, which I knew was there. And as I started learning about it, that's that's when things started coming into the light, so to speak. Mm, OK, so then. Yeah, all right. So you started learning about that, the history, economic history, money, power and, and how that kind of uh, moves the world, um, especially into war. And I, th I think we're just at the beginning of seeing that play out right now. I mean, I think Ukraine is just the beginning of what bigger, unfortunate, bigger things that will probably play out. But. Um, so then where did, cause what you're doing in Guatemala is very unique and maybe, maybe you should kind of just explain it real quick and then well, I'll start, uh, you can start where okay. you want to, you can either okay. explain what it is first and then how you got there. You know what I mean? Because I think, I think for me, the journey is always so fascinating. Yeah. Okay. Being I, an entrepreneur. I, you know? And you asked that question. I didn't answer because I was going off the, you know, because, because <laughs> okay. it is, because it, it is complex, you know, and, yeah. and had I not put a lot of thought into this, then maybe this is not an interesting story, but I have put a lot of thought into this. So yeah. um, the, the, okay. So the connection is this when, when I was a missions pastor and when I've gone on missions trips, the church does a lot of good things. Okay. We go and build churches. We go and dig water wells, um, build clinics, schools. We evangelize. But one thing that is always difficult to do is to provide economic opportunity without creating dependence. Whenever you give people money yeah, and it's, it's not, right. it's not, it has nothing to do with who you're ministering to. It's human nature. Once you give people money, you create a dependent situation. And the worst thing you want to do as a church and as a witness is create that situation. Because if, if you're giving money to someone in a, a country, let's just say it's Guatemala, and they're associating you with the Christian mission, and they come to you multiple times because they need the money or a family member or everybody in the community knows that they can come to you for money or whatever, the moment you say no, that immediately affects your Christian witness. So creating dependence is a very bad thing on the mission field. And so um, when I um, started learning about Bitcoin, what it could do, the empowerment that it could provide, the, the economic freedom that it could provide, 
I started thinking, wow, I, I would love to take this technology, and that's what it is. It's a technology. It's not just a money. I would love to take this technology down to Guatemala in the community that we served and help transform um, that society and that community. And that's that's kind of the that that was the synthesis or that was the joining of Bitcoin and Guatemala was my Bitcoin knowledge becoming a lever of power and freedom and the 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 uh, work in missions where you know we could now as a as a as christians provide that other piece of the pie that uh, we just can't provide now without dependence and let me be clear uh, being blessed by the lord does not mean you're going to get wealth okay um the lord made it very clear we will always have the poor among us but the other kind of thing that i started reading and it's i make it pretty evident in, in my book is that the the morality of our economic system is so bad and it affects so many people that we are a party to this economic system because we participate in it. We don't say anything about it. And it has a trickle down, negative trickle down effect in people in developing countries. And so here's a perfect example. And so we go to church. We let's let's say that we're in, in a CLC meeting. And one of the guys is talking about a, a difficult business decision or, or whatever. And um, invariably, what's going to happen is, uh, well, I had to make this decision and, um, you know, I feel bad for, you know, the outcome or whatever, but, you know, business is business. And, you know, we, we, we don't do that on the outside of the church. We don't go to a business meeting and people are questioning our ethics or morality and say, we don't say, well, church is church. And, you know, so mm. somehow we bring the world into our, our church meetings, but we don't take the church outside and into our business meetings. Mm. And so, uh, and I, I've been guilty of that. So it's, I'm not saying that I'm, I'm better than anybody. What I'm saying is that um, we can now take a Christ, Christian ethos with Bitcoin in the form of Bitcoin and right the wrongs of participating in a very immoral uh, economic system. And I bet most of your listeners don't know that the, the, the father of modern economic theory, John Maynard Keynes, um, that's where we get the term Keynesian economics, uh, the guy was a socialist, he was an atheist, and he, by all accounts, was uh, a pedophile and um, uh, a homosexual. And again, I don't want to make this, you know, about that, but that's probably the last person any of us would trust to with our own money, you know? And yeah. so we've got trillions and trillions of dollars floating around the world that are based on a very faulty economic theory. And whether you're, you live in China, Russia, Europe, or the U S they all have different, you know, um, monikers about the economic um, system that they have, but they're all based on Keynesian economics. And the Keynesian economic theory is that the state should have uh, more and more control. Uh, monetary policy is based on uh, fiat. Uh, fiat is a new invention of the, of the 20th century. It was invented when um, all, all powers that went into the First World War, except for the U.S., came off the gold standard. Uh, so if I'm getting too detailed, just stop me. But the, the most historians thought that when the first world war started, that the war would last for six, uh, six months based on the, they calculated all the gold reserves and it didn't go on for six months. It went on for four brutal years and more lives were lost in that war um, than, than ever. And uh, because people the the country started uh, printing money, they 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 uh, they 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 made their own money so they could make the warships and the planes and send the soldiers. Um, yeah, it's it's completely immoral. That's not what the Lord wants. Yeah, um, I think uh, what you uh, one of the things you say in your book uh, that I loved is um, is in some other context, but the final defiance in the form of fiat would come to infiltrate the very lives of believers like a cancer that is circulating within us, the effects of which we can't see until it is too late. Yep. And that's the, that is what's so 
um, what's the word I'm, I'm looking for? It, it, it deceptive. You just don't realize it in, until, yep. and when you and I were talking before that we recorded that I've done a fair amount of economic study that's brought, that brought me to a place to understand the corruption of our monetary system before Bitcoin came along. Um, most people don't have the benefit of that education or knowledge beforehand. They were just taught what generations previous to them taught them about how to function in our monetary uh, reality. And, um, and so you're right, it infiltrates our lives. It, um, and I love the other point you make, and you say that um, uh, it's not that Satan just influences us and others to his bidding, but we are inside his machinery working as hard as we can to resist, but not realizing where we are. And, and I, you know, that machinery is this monetary system that we're caught inside that Satan is using and manipulating us through, um, but we're blind to, you know? Yep. Yeah. So, but you're and right. I think, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, I mean, I, um, that I, I think if there's one thing that sentence or portion of this broadcast or podcast that people should key on is that, because you as a pastor, as a leader in the church, you know, you're always trying to get people to do more, you know, um, spend more time praying, reading, spend more time at the church and spend more time engaging with um, fellow believers. And we have that desire within us. But wait a minute, I've got to pay my bills. Um, I've got to get my kids to sports or whatever. I'm sometimes I'm working two jobs, three jobs or whatever. And we're doing that because um, our our lives are being inflated away and we don't realize what's going on. And so if so, if our lives are being inflated away, that means we're spending less and less time with each other and with the Lord. Imagine what would happen if our lives are being deflated. We're getting our time back. Um, yeah. And that's what Bitcoin does. And we can get into that. But Bitcoin allows us to slow down because the rate of um, compounded annual increase in the price of Bitcoin allows me to save my time and do what I love to do. And that's the trap that we don't realize that we're in. And Bitcoin right now is that that lifeboat that we can look to. And for, for, for if for any reason, whoever's listening wants to look at it in that perspective, that's what I would urge you to do. And I think that, you know, God bless Dave Ramsey, but I think that he's helped a lot of millions and millions of Christians um, get out of debt. But um, Dave Ramsey is a boomer. He's he's benefited unwittingly to uh, from the economic system that we've lived in, and we we can't we can't follow that model anymore because it's broken. And mm. uh, we need a new uh, we need a new and different model. And um, Bitcoin's the way. And and absolutely, yeah, yeah. So okay, so then let's talk about what exactly you're doing now in Guatemala with Bitcoin and how it's impacting the community. And then how, by doing it, you're helping to, uh, to stave off that enabling kind of thing, which can happen in, in missions. Great. So what we're doing in, in Guatemala in Panajachel, Lake Atitlan, which is pictured behind me. And by the way, for those who aren't familiar with Bitcoin memeology, um, the the G, the logo is a Kitsau, and you might notice that he's got a little laser eye. Um, that's a that's a Bitcoin <laughs> yeah. meme. Um, yes. So it, it's not that that's an evil Kitsau. It's a Bitcoin meme. Any, anyway, so what we're doing? <laughs> good, good clarification. <laughs> <laughs> so what what we're doing in uh, Panajachel is. We're basically bringing um, the technology of Bitcoin and by providing education first. So we're working at the same school, Centro Educativo Josue in Panachel, and we're teaching the kids about Bitcoin. And the reason we're doing that is we, we, we're basing what we're doing on what was done in El Zante in El Salvador at Bitcoin Beach. And if you've, uh, during the recording of this podcast this week, they've had about 44 central bankers down in El Zante and El Salvador to learn about Bitcoin, to be to become free from the IMF control. And so um, what they did when they first tried to introduce Bitcoin uh, about three or four years ago into the community, they found that the adults just weren't picking it up very well because it's a new technology and it's a new money and they were very suspicious of it. So what they, they shifted focus and wanted to start teaching children. So we're following that model. So we started teaching children 
And in addition to that, we are actually bringing the technology, not just the money, but the technology down to Panhachel. We've set up what's called a full Bitcoin node at the school, the first that I'm aware of um, at a school in Central America. We set up a miner, a Bitcoin miner at the school and at the municipality, uh, the first Bitcoin miner in a municipality in the Americas. And then um, in addition to that, because we don't really have any sort of endowment to we're bootstrapping this, you know, I've, I've gone down there and on my own dime, we don't have any uh, funds to support this. So we wanted to introduce Bitcoin mining to kind of intro, to um, inject Bitcoin into the community. Mm -hmm. And, and part of that process of the Bitcoin mining is while the, while the lake is beautiful, it's, it's slowly dying, similar to what happened with Lake Tahoe in the eighties and nineties. You know, the, the lake itself sits at about 5,000 feet and the mountains around it are reaching upwards of about um, um, 8,000 feet above sea level. And there are a bunch of tiny farms and, and uh, villages around the lake. And just like any developing country, there's poor wastewater management, <clears throat> the farming residue and the chemicals drain down into the, into the lake. And so uh, and there have been many attempts to try to clean the lake, but they've all failed. And what we can do with Bitcoin mining is provide an economic incentive with the Bitcoin mining to actually uh, clean, clean the lake. And I can describe that a little bit more. So that's kind of our multi-tiered approach. And I would love to see Bitcoin legalized as legal tender in Guatemala like it is in El Salvador. But I think the, the politics of, of what's going on in Guatemala are a lot different than El Salvador. But that's my eventual goal is that, that the whole of Guatemala accepts uh, Bitcoin as legal tender. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, and real quick, just to folk, folks who are not familiar with Bitcoin, when you say that you set up a, a Bitcoin miner, um, just give a kind of brief description of what you mean by what is a Bitcoin miner and okay. what exactly is it doing? Yeah. Yeah. So the there there are basically two computers, types of computers that control the Bitcoin network. And for those of who who don't know, Bitcoin is the strongest and most secure computer network in the world, even more secure than Google and, and um, uh, Facebook so, and Apple for that matter. But um, so there's a Bitcoin miner. And uh, unfortunately, whoever chose that term miner, terrible name because it has all these negative connotations about destroying the environment and all that. Uh, a miner is nothing more than a fancy computer, uh, but it's a very specific computer. And they're, they're called ASICs, application specific integrated circuit. That's all they do is mine Bitcoin. And all they're doing is doing computational um, algorithms to figure out what the next block in the blockchain is going to be. So you have the Bitcoin miner that generates Bitcoin, and then you've got the Bitcoin nodes that validate um, all of the transactions that are that are occurring on the Bitcoin blockchain. And so that's that's what a miner is. Yeah, it's a fancy, yeah. it's a fancy computer. It uses a lot of energy. And the the reason why it uses so much energy is because it's it, they, these miners do about 10 billion computations every 10 minutes, and it requires a significant amount of energy. And despite popular FUD or fear, uncertainty, and doubt about Bitcoin, uh, the majority of Bitcoin mining is done with renewable energy because there's no economic incentive. It, well, let's put it this way. I, I use the, the example of a taxi cab driver. If, if I'm driving a taxi cab and the price of gas goes up, and my fares stay the same, I'm going to lose profit. And so if I'm a smart taxi cab driver, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to find the cheapest gas in the city before I start accepting fares. And Bitcoin mines the same way. The only economic variable, not the only, but the single most important economic variable in Bitcoin mining is the cost of electricity. And so as a Bitcoin miner, you want to find the cheapest electricity. The cheapest electricity is not coal and uh, oil and and whatnot. It's renewable energy, and um, so that's why we're down in uh, Guatemala. Is we're we're trying to exploit in a, in a positive way, not a negative way. We're trying to exploit mm -hmm. all the natural resources. This there's every single type of renewable energy is available on the lake uh, for Bitcoin mining, but um, because of the way energy grids work, they're usually um, developed around population centers. So all this free and abundant energy is left stranded because the population center of Guatemala City is three hours away. With Bitcoin mining, we can actually come with our units and use the energy at um, not free, but almost free and 
provide a significant economic opportunity for the region. And in addition to that, we can actually be a part of e-cycle, e-machine recycling or electronic machine recycling, where we can take old miners, what are called the S9s. They are the first ASIC miners that were developed, and they're about six or seven years old now. Normally, there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of these that are unplugged, and a lot of them are just thrown away um, and wasted. Well, if you're using a renewable energy source uh, where the energy becomes almost free, you can recycle and use these uh, miners um, in a country like Guatemala at a profit. So that's, a, that's another kind of really cool thing about what we're doing down there as well. That, wow, that is really cool. Okay, and so the other, so you, you mentioned it, there's trapped energy down there, like natural gas, and there's some other very creative ways. What I love about this whole process, so I'm coming up to 30,000 feet again, yeah. kind of uh, give some perspective to, to our listeners again, because we were kind of in the weeds there, which is yeah, good, that's yeah, fine. Yeah. Hopefully it's making it more uh, curious. But what I love about this is that, Patrick, you are, you're taking that entrepreneurial spirit, the things that you learned, and, and you're combining it with, with missions and finding innovative ways to serve the community down there and have a redemptive influence, reflect Christ, glorify God. Um, I love that, man. Oh my goodness. It just makes my heart swell to think about how you're doing these things down there. So praise God for that. And I think all of us as men uh, can, that's what, man, I just think that's so fun. Why? Do, I think all of us as, as men should have that same mentality to like, okay, what, where has God given us that wealth of knowledge? You know, where has God given yeah. us that, um, that leverage uh, just based on just gifts and talents and abilities? And how can we utilize that to bring glory to God? And it's just a beautiful thing that you're doing it that way down there. I, so, I appreciate that. Well, the sneaky little thing is, you know, this is not an evangelical effort down here. I make that very clear because the Bitcoin community, you know, uh, it's a pretty motley crew, a lot of diehard atheists in the Bitcoin community. So, in fact, we, we have one that um, is down there now on my last trip. Uh, he and his girlfriend came up from Colombia and they wanted to see Bitcoin Lake. And I said, great, come on up. So um, and I, I tell everybody, you know, this is not an evangelical um, effort here. But uh, wink, wink, if you want me to talk to you about Jesus, I'm, ha I'm happy to do it. So I, and they've all heard me say that, you know, and then well, on one of my one of my last and I'm not ashamed about it. You know, what's really freeing about the Bitcoin community is it's very accepting. You know, you can come up with the craziest ideas and talk about it. And Bitcoiners are unless it's against Bitcoin, um, they're very open to it. And so I feel totally open talking about my faith um, with Bitcoiners and you know, they know that we have a common bond within Bitcoin and, and that allows us to have a, a unifying um, talk. And that's why I wrote my second book, which maybe we can touch on. But yeah. um, on one of the last nights we were there, I had a reporter that was with us and he spent the whole whole time down there. He's going to do a, an article on what we're doing. And so he was interviewing me and uh, he he was asking about my intersection of faith and the fact that I baptized somebody down in, in Miami after the, thank God for Bitcoin conference. Which, and Which I got to be there for and witness, yeah, by yeah, the way, that was yeah, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, um, this Bitcoiner and his girlfriend, both Bitcoiners from Columbia, they're Swiss, but they were in Columbia at the time. Uh, they're just sitting there listening to me tell the story. And I basically told the entire gospel story while they were listening. <laughs> so it was awesome, That's you know? Great. And yes. then and then the reporter said, well, you know, I mean, we could talk about other things. Um, you know, we've got other company here. And and um, this new Bitcoiner friend of mine from Columbia said, no, it's it's okay. We can talk about this. So it was just like, wow. I mean, when would we have an opportunity to do something like that, you know? And it was just yeah. fantastic, yeah. It's funny. Yeah. You say you're not evangelical, but yeah. I don't care what you do. If, if you're a Christian. Yeah, that's right. Evangelism goes with you wherever you go. That's right. Like, I don't care. Right. And, and the projects, it's all inherent. That redemptive nature is all inherent in what you do. Yeah. So um, yeah, man, that's beautiful. So, yeah. okay. So connect the dots real quick for us in terms of how this Bitcoin mining is, is, is going to help clean the lake. Okay. I'll give you just one succinct example. And there are okay. many. Okay. And we found more when we were down there this last time. All right. In um, Panachel, there's a wastewater treatment facility. And I've never stepped foot inside of a wastewater treatment facility in my life. 
until uh, in January. So there's a wastewater treatment facility down there that has a giant, what we call a biodigester. And if you're not familiar with what a biodigester is, you take uh, organic material, you let it decompose, and at a certain level, you can take it out and it becomes compost or fertilizer or whatever. Well, all organic material, not just from the wastewater treatment facility, but all organic material, uh, when it decomposes, releases methane. Mm -hmm. Methane is a gas that is two to three times more harmful to the environment than CO2. In the U.S., like if you've driven by, like um, uh, not too far from where I am, there's a, we have a large uh, waste management landfill uh, for the city that I live in. And you'll see these pipes coming up out of the ground. And in modern waste management, you create basically what's called a, a sterile tomb or a vault where all the material has to go into and you line it so it can't leak into the groundwater, but um, the, it produces methane. And so they have this biodigester. It's, it's got methane that it's producing. They have a flare stack. So normally they would flare methane from the stack, but the, the biodigester is cracked. And so the methane and the CO2 are leaking out of this digester. And so what we want to do is go down there, um, cap or fix the biodigester, trap the methane, flare it, but hook up a generator to it, and then mine Bitcoin. And so that would immediately solve uh, methane leaking into the environment. It creates an economic incentive for someone to actually do something about it because it's not being fixed right now because it costs money and they have limited resources to begin with. So Bitcoin mining provides an economic incentive to actually fix what's wrong with the wastewater treatment facility. And that process could be replicated in the dozen plus uh, communities around the lake and the hundreds of, of farms and, and small homes and, and villages around the lake as well. Wow. Yeah. So one, one question I know that may came up, come up in people's minds, I know did for me, is so there, there's only going to be so many Bitcoin. You know, there's 21 million is all there's ever going to be. So what happens to all this mining when the last Bitcoin is mined? Well, uh, so the last... That's a great question. The last Bitcoin will be, will be mined about 100 years from now in uh, the year 2140. But uh, what you, Bitcoin mining, okay, so when you look at the blockchain, and if, if I'm getting too down in the weeds, let me know. But when you look at the blockchain, you have the, the, the first part of the block, when the block is added to the blockchain, you have something called the Coinbase, not to be confused with the company Coinbase, but there's something on the blockchain called the Coinbase, and that's the issuance of new coins. And that's how we get the every 10 minutes, we get six and a quarter new coins put into the network. Um, well, within the ledger of the blockchain, you have all the thousands of transactions that are going on. So if I send you Bitcoin, that's a transaction that's recorded on, onto the Bitcoin blockchain. And that transaction costs something. Um, and usually very, very small cost, but that's, a, that's called a minor reward. So even if the Coinbase goes away in 100 years, you're still going to have a monetary network at that point that's fully mature and billions of people at that point are going to be transacting in Bitcoin. And so you're going to have billions of transaction fees that are going to provide the economic incentive. So mining is not going to go away. It's going to, the mining network secures the network and you can't have Bitcoin transactions without the miners. Great. That's awesome. Okay. Thank you for that explanation. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Real quick, so we talked a little bit about the the Christian case for Bitcoin, the book that you wrote, um, which again I can't I can't man I can't say it enough. Like folks, I, guys, I, I encourage you to pick this up and uh, and give a read for so many different reasons. It, even if it's just to understand economics a little bit more from a you know from a, a Christian biblical perspective, it's it's worth the read. And um, I think I, I think Mike, you said you were thinking about adding this to the CLC curriculum or something like that. Huh? <laughs> That's right. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Well, we'll, yes. I've, I've got a meeting with our president. We'll, we'll talk I, I put that, I, I put that out publicly just now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good stuff. No there. pressure. No it. pressure. Right, okay. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, we couldn't stop a CLC group from, uh, you know, picking one of these up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's right. To what we're that's doing. right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hand, hand, but yeah. <laughs> so what real quick, what was your impetus for, for writing the book? Uh, a lack of a uh, Christian voice. Um, in this space. And you mentioned Jimmy Song, uh, a Christian, big influencer. Thank God for Bitcoin. 
I, I, I felt, and I'm not, I'm not alone in this, that um, thank, thank God for Bitcoin's a great book, but it, it's not a very, it's not a very deep book. And mm -hmm. it doesn't, it doesn't promote a Christian ethos. I, and I mentioned to this to you before we recorded, it's, it's like going to thank God, uh, TGIF, it's saying, thank God for Friday. Yes, we have a lot to be thankful for. We're thankful for Friday. You know, we're thankful for the restaurant, TGIF. Uh, we're thankful for Bitcoin. Um, and it's, it, but it doesn't really go in depth as to why are we here? How did we get here? What we should be doing about it? And more importantly, as Christians, what, so that towards the end of the book, I broke it down into why the Christian should care, why the church should care, and how it can be used in missions. And so, that's that's why I wrote the book, and great. and then I you know I also started a, a podcast, Mission Bitcoin. It was the first Christian right. podcast in uh, the Bitcoin circles. I just felt like there needed to be a voice to kind of explain this from the Christian perspective because I feel strongly after reading uh, and studying about Bitcoin that man, if there's something that Christians should be promoting, it's Bitcoin, no question. Amen, man. Amen. And and I've listened to your podcast as well, and actually. Um, what was really fun, and I'll just, maybe it won't matter, but I'll, I'm not going to say, I'll let you kind of say his name, but like I listened to the interview with the guy that you baptized in Miami. So while we were in Miami, there were two guys, one, you baptized one guy, and then a second guy said, you know, I haven't been baptized, I need to be, but both were atheists before, mm -hmm. before getting involved in Bitcoin. And Bitcoin actually played a role in revealing the truth to them that led them to the gospel and yep. to put their faith in Christ. But one of them, it was, it was so funny li listening to um, one of the early episodes of your podcast and you interviewed the one guy and you could tell he was on the cusp. He was mm -hmm. almost there. That was super fun to listen to that after seeing, after seeing the baptism and where he was at that point. <laughs> yeah. So that's Tomer, Tomer Strolight. And uh, he's a, a pretty significant influencer in the Bitcoin circles. And that's a remarkable story. So I, as I was starting to formulate my Christian perspective related to Bitcoin, I started seeing some strange similarities between Bitcoin and Christianity. And I, I struggled with, man, this is really blasphemous. What I, these similarities, I, I, I like, I, like, for instance, uh, the immutability of, of Bitcoin, the immutability of God's word, the, um, the so-called immaculate conception of Bitcoin. And, you know, for those who don't know anything about Bitcoin, you can learn about it. But I'm just telling you what my experience was, you know, the immaculate conception of, of Jesus. And for, for Catholics, that means something different for us. But I was trying to draw parallels um, and the sacrifice that Satoshi made, um, the creator of Bitcoin, in creating this, this uh, technology. Um, so I started seeing all these, these parallels and I, I, for the I prayed about it. I thought, Lord, this is just really blasphemous. I mean, I, I, I really don't want to have these thoughts, but then as I prayed about it more and more, I just decided, okay, um, this is just too uncanny. So I started writing on medium and I wrote on Medium, not because I felt like I was going that anybody was going to listen to me or read it. I just wanted to codify my thoughts and yeah. put it out there. And nobody followed me. I mean, I didn't have any followers. And I had written probably about three or four articles over about a period of three to four weeks. And I actually randomly saw a Twitter um, post from Tomer. Mm -hmm. And I used it in one of my early articles on, on Medium. And within about, it was within a week, mm -hmm. I get a message from him on, from, on the Medium platform I was using saying, hey, Patrick, I just ran across your, I mean, out of the blue, this yeah. guy I'm quoting in my articles finds me on Medium, how I don't know. And he says, hey, Patrick, I'm, I'm reading your stuff. I'm having some very similar thoughts about Christianity and Bitcoin. I'd love to talk with you. So then one thing led to another. Um, I meet him on, we, we Zoom together. He lives up in Toronto. And yeah, he commits his life to Christ because Bitcoin provided this absolute truth 
that as a atheist, you don't believe in absolute truth. You believe in a closed system, determinism and relativism. And so it became, it became this intellectual angst or tension that he could not reconcile. And so he started seeing this truth in Bitcoin and he started having a religious experience with it. <laughs> and for, for us, we, we don't struggle with that. You know, we, we've been made fun of for believing in absolute truth all of our Christian lives. And so that's, that's why a lot of atheists in Bitcoin struggle with these religious feelings. And that's why I wrote my second book, The, the, um, the Philosophy of Bitcoin and Religion, because they, they've started, some of them have started taking our Christian language and using it to describe their religious experience within Bitcoin. And I, I had had just enough. It's like, okay, this is the last time I want to see anything written about, you know, Bitcoin and the Bitcoin Messiah or Bitcoin's our savior. And yeah. I just had enough. And I said, okay, I'm going to answer this. And I put it, I codified it in a book. And so the, the second book's really about making the, the logical case from a very first principles logic perspective that an atheist would understand this is why what you believe in about Bitcoin is incorrect. You're, you, you know, like Paul said in, on the, at the Areopagus, you're, you're worship a God you don't know. And so I'm pointing them to the God that they don't know. Yeah. Oh man, that's profound. That's well, yeah. oh, you know, hmm, that is great. So, okay. So that, that's great. So that's your second book, which was called, what was it again? <laughs> the philosophy of Bitcoin and religion. The philosophy of Bitcoin and religion. Okay, so I need to. All this stuff will be in the show notes for you folks to to take a look at. Man, that is interesting. You said something there, and I'm I'm forgetting what you said, and I'm going off track here a little bit because I really about Paul. To... Yeah, yeah. Okay, so Paul saying you you're worshiping a god, an unknown god, um, and I and I, I can tell you who that unknown god is. What what a correlation or, or metaphor to to what's going on with Bitcoin. Put, because you're right. A lot of people are looking at Bitcoin as their savior. That's right. Which was one of the things that I really, really appreciated again during the Thank God for Bitcoin conference. And this is where I talk, this is what I mean when I said that they were theologically on point. They did such a very clear, intentional job of, of separating Bitcoin from, from our faith and from Jesus. Um, Bitcoin is not Jesus. Jesus is, is the Messiah. Um, and and Bitcoin is, is a tool and, and it will be, That's right. and, and I think someone used, I think you've used this analogy too, similar to what the Roman road was for the spreading mm -hmm. of the gospel in the early church. Bitcoin has a potential to have that kind of redemptive influence. Absolutely. And, and in fact, um, I have in my second book, I have a, a graphic, it's called the shadow truth. And what I do is, have you, you've not read the second book? Have you not seen that? I've not read. No, so, I just finished the first one. So, <laughs> so the, this one too. The, um, the shadow truth is basically, um, it's probably because I've got the, the, the yeah. screen thing on, but basically I put the cross in the middle, Bitcoin behind it. And I basically point out all the similarities between Bitcoin and, and, and Jesus and the cross. And, um, so there are so many aspects to Bitcoin that are definitely a tool. It is not the truth. It is a truth. It's a big truth. It's a big, big truth, but it's not the truth that we know. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that the, the other thing about, you know, Bitcoin and religion is that we can, we, we can, we have to be careful that we don't worship Bitcoin. Uh, we can't serve two right. gods at once, uh, God right. and mammon. And so Bitcoin has the, the potential to do that, but we know based on scripture that there is a difference, um, but it, it's just a tool. It's a, and it's a great yeah. tool. So you can, what, what I would love to do, and I haven't had a lot of time to do this, but what I would love to see happen is that the church use Bitcoin as a tool for evangelism. And, and why, what, why I think that's important is if we look at, we live in a post-Christian world right now, and you and I and the guys that are listening to this can talk churchy language and we can understand each other. You know, we can talk about Jesus. We can talk about his death, his resurrection. We all understand what that means. Um, we can even when we see a cross, we know exactly what it means. But the cross is probably the most recognized symbol in the world. But most people don't place any connotation upon it. it it's just a, a neat looking symbol. And. Right now, Bitcoin adoption is about 2% of the global population. 
if we could use Bitcoin as a tool to point to Christ, then we have 98% growth in Bitcoin to use as a, as a tool for evangelism to point people to the real truth. And so I would love to see the church, you know, Hey, we're going to have a, we're going to have a conference on Bitcoin. Come learn about this new technology. And while the, while you're there learning about Bitcoin, whoever's teaching it can talk about, okay, we're going to talk about the immutability of the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, we're also going to just tell you that immutability is not a new thing. You know, we've had that in the church and we have, we have open source technology called um, the Canon that's been in the church, you know, for almost 2000 years. So that's there are right. so, yeah. So the, the Bitcoin can be used to teach about um, the gospel. Mm. Yeah. Amen. I, to I totally agree. I've seen so many similarities there as well. Um, so that I, I, I'd be all for that. Um, all right. So this man, we, <laughs> we, what a great conversation. I am really grateful, uh, Patrick, to have you on. And um, I'm sad that we're kind of coming to the end here of our time. So I, I'd love to stay in touch and, and hear more as time goes on, as you make more progress down in Guatemala, get more updates. Yeah, you um, need to come down. Oh, man, I want to. You have no idea. Oh, yes. Well, let's talk <laughs> about that for sure. Um, so in the meantime, um, so you've got, you've got a podcast are you still on Medium? Are you still writing on Medium? I, I, I update our trips on Medium. Yeah, 67 okay. Corvette on Medium. Okay, great. Yeah. Where, where else can folks uh, find you? Uh, on Twitter. And strangely enough, for some reason, Bitcoiners hang out on Twitter. So you can find me on Twitter at ENT Surge, ear, nose, and throat surgery, ENT yeah. Surge. And then at um, Lake Bitcoin. Uh, on Twitter as well. Okay, that's great. And we'll I'll have links in the show notes for all of you to kind of access your books, uh, find your podcasts, all that kind of stuff as well. Because um, man, I Patrick, you're doing incredible things, man. And I and I'm I'm inspired. <laughs> I appreciate I'm inspired that. Inspired by what by what you're up to. So um, before we go though, I want to pray for you um, and your ministry. And, uh, and then we'll, then we'll say goodbye. Okay. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Father God, you are good. Oh my goodness. You are so good. Um, God, thank you so much for this conversation with Patrick. Thank you for his ministry. Thank you for the ways you've gifted him and, um, and provided for him Lord to be able to leverage his talents and abilities and knowledge and other resources, God, for, for your kingdom purposes, uh, especially in Guatemala, Lord, I pray father, that you would continue to provide for him that you would uh, blaze the trail, go ahead of him, Lord, in, in ways that maybe he doesn't even know he needs yet, Father, and, and make those connections. Um, and God, ultimately, we, we, we ask that you be glorified. We, uh, we pray, God, that uh, people in Guatemala would see, um, see you reflected um, in what Patrick is doing in his mission and in Bitcoin down there, Lord. And so uh, thank you again for this time together. I pray, Lord, your protection and blessing over Patrick and his family and all of his future endeavors, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, man. Appreciate that. Thank you so much, Patrick. Thanks, brother. Thanks, brother.